And now to our main event. Chris Matthews is the host of MSNBC's Hardball. Chris began his career on television in 1994 as host of a two-hour nightly program on the NBC-owned America's Talking Network. Three years later, he launched Hardball, now on MSNBC, with, which was the title of his best-selling handbook on real-life politics published in 1988. He has been on the air every weekday night since. Amazing. In all the years Chris has been involved in the country's public life, he's kept an abiding faith in electoral politics, his steadfast hope that the American people will make the best judgment on who should lead. <laughs> he has kept that faith through war and peace, good times and bad, through great leaders and not so great leaders. He has never lost his vigorous love of democracy and how it can serve to make this country through all its challenges a more perfect union. He is the author of a number of best-selling books, including Jack Kennedy, Elusive Hero, Tip and the Gipper, When Politics Worked, Kennedy and Nixon, Hardball, and now Bobby Kennedy, A Raging Spirit. Chris has generously offered this afternoon to sign books um, after the talk. Uh, he'll also answer some questions before he does book signing. Uh, the books are for sale in our shop back there, so please, I encourage you to get books and to, sign, to get him to sign them. Uh, and it is really my great, great pleasure to welcome Chris Matthews to the stage. It's really nice. Everybody has better things to do. I dressed up today, by the way. Just I remember George Jessel one time wouldn't wouldn't perform when the kids showed up and didn't look like him. Anyway, I am not that tough. Anyway, it's great to talk to you. I know it's a weird day. I was just on Fifth Avenue with my beautiful wife Kathleen. She's back there. There she is. And uh, recent uh, chair of the Democratic Party of Maryland, and then she was a House candidate, and I think she sh should run for governor next time. That's what I want. That was my dream. Jim Casey and his wife Mary went to school with me. He's a school teacher, a committed, a committed public servant. Jim Casey, thank you for coming to us. Um, well, I don't know about, here's what we know is happening in the world today, and that is that there are no indictments. I was getting the news at 5 o'clock last night, and uh, I was shocked at 5, what's this? Usually you dump news you don't let out, close of business Friday. It's an old trick of the press because you somehow miss this Saturday, you miss the Sunday. It's a tricky. You miss the columnist you write on Thursday. It's an old gimmick. It's the dumping zone. And uh, I know that's still true today in the uh, sort of the day of uh, social media, but it's uh, odd. Five o'clock Friday, they've had the thing, they've been honing this thing for months. And so what's that about? I don't know what that's about. No indictments. Uh, I thought, I, I, I did my uh, Hound of the Basketball, Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes mind. I start using powers of deduction. And I think ahead of everybody else, I said, wait, if nobody gets indicted, how do you show collusion? Because the president was, if anything, vulnerable to a RICO charge, you know, a ringleader. He didn't do anything. He had people do stuff. And if nobody's getting indicted for doing stuff, he must have gotten off on this one. So I'm wondering about that. I'm also wondering about obstruction. Uh, I don't think obstruction, even proven, is going to work with the Republicans. I think collusion would have some of them, some of them. Uh, I think Pelosi is one of the smartest politicians we have ever seen. Um, I, I, I went at her from the left when she decided to uh, say there's not going to be impeachment on the table, and now she looks pretty damn smart because she didn't get, uh, you know, undercut or, you know, hit by that. She looks like she was smart. And she is always smart. She's the toughest. She's much tougher than Tip ever was. I worked for Tip for six years. Nobody is tough as she. She is. She has passed the Machiavellian test of being, <laughs> hey, Tim Russert passed it too, of being feared but not hated. 
You want to be feared but not hated. That is the trick. That's the simultaneous equation you have to do in politics. Because if you're hated, you'll be dead. People get rid of you. But if you're feared and not hated, whoa. That's where, that's where Pelosi is. And she keeps lists, by the way. I can think of four or five people. Look out, Kathleen Rice. There's all kinds, and, and Seth Moulton. Anybody that challenged her will be remembered. So I'm watching her. And Chuck's not so bad, too. But the thing about Chuck, your guy, is that um, the thing about Chuck is they don't want famous leaders. You have to understand about the Senate. They're all egomaniacs. All of them want to be president of the world. And they don't want their leader to get any ink, because any ink or any time on TV that person gets, they should have gotten. So you, you watch Chuck surprisingly walk away from cameras lately. I mean, it's a new thing. But he doesn't like, you don't want to get a lot of television if you're the Senate leader. It's a weird thing. They all want to be. They don't like to think that guy's a schmoo. He doesn't get any, any attention because that saves more time for them. It's how they think about it, you know. Speaker's different. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Bobby Kennedy because that's why I'm here and because he's such a New, a New York figure in our past. He's such a New York guy. He became certainly a real, he grew up here. He took a lot of heat when he ran against Keating as carpetbagger, but in fact, he was here for the time from five to 17. He's living in Bronxville. Uh, and sometimes in, f further in, into Manhattan, uh, the family was moving around a lot. So he grew, up, he grew up here in many ways in New York. And, um, and certainly, uh, he had a great line when they said, why are you running? Because they were hitting him for being a car. He says, I don't need the money. <laughs> That's a pretty good line. I don't need the celebrity. I don't need the office space. They can, they, they can call me general for the rest of my life because he's attorney general. He's like, I got a title. I just want to serve. That was a great answer, actually. Just say, I just want to serve. But what are you going to say about that, Ken? Anyway, and there's nothing wrong with Keating. He's a pretty good moderate Republican in, in a way that they don't exist anymore. There's no more people like Ken Keating or Jack Javits. I'm sorry, Jack Javits upstate, Jake Javits downstate. Right? <laughs> let, me, let me get that right. Uh, that's a pile for you, different nicknames. Uh, I want to talk about it, but I also want to talk about why I wrote this book and how I get to write books. I'm on the inside of politics. I come from uh, 15 years inside politics, uh, working for one of the great people ever, Ed Muskie, for Three years, I worked for Frank Moss, the last liberal from Utah. And then I worked, it would start with Moss, three years, four years with Muskie. Uh, uh, I worked for Jimmy Carr the whole term. I was a speechwriter. I was on the plane when we lost right to the end. Rick Hertzberg of the New Yorker was my friend who I met through another guy I met at a campaign here in Brooklyn Heights years ago. So I've been around the track. I know a lot of politics, and that's one reason why these sources will talk to me. I get people talk to me like, H.R. Haldeman talked to me right before he died. He gave me plenty of time. He kept going to the bathroom. He was dying of a terrible stomach uh, disease. And he was a Christian scientist, so he wouldn't do anything about it. And he was just spending all this time with me. And people like that would give me information that I've been getting all my life. So I've had a privileged life when it comes to getting inside. He once said to me that Nixon's feeling towards Kennedy was mysterious and inexplicable. He had some fondness for Kennedy, which was all through his life. They were friends for 13 years before they ran against each other. So it's a, it's a, that's another book I wrote. Uh, the next book's going to be about me, which is going to be really interesting. <laughs> I'll tell most of the story, not all of it. Uh, but I think it's great to uh, see. I'm not a virgin politically. I've been in politics. I work for TIP. I've, I believe I, oh, we've never had a perfect president. We've never had one as imperfect as this one. <laughs> and I, it's, my, it's not me about crimes. It's about basic manners yeah. and decency. <laughs> and you don't make fun of people's appearance. You're taught that when you're five. You don't make stupid nicknames about people's appearance. You don't run them down. You run against them. You don't run them down. He runs people down. He's already going after Beto. Beto. He's already going after him with the hands. He's going after him on that. Well, fine, that's harmless. But he gets much more nasty. He'll get nastier as it gets closer. I think next year's election is going to be unbelievable. I think after last night's news, maybe Trump. I thought he'd have to have a lot of perfect storms going for him to get reelected. He has to exploit the, the abortion, leg of the abortion thing in Pennsylvania. He has to go after socialism in the suburbs. He's got to go after the open borders in a lot of places up north, not in El Paso, up north where they're upset about it. Uh, he can exploit a lot of issues, ethnic issues, tribal issues, all kinds of issues, uh, economic issues among the middle class. He knows how to do it. But I think the Democrats have a year and a half now, at least through next June, to pick somebody. Right now, I think it's Kamala. Is running the best campaign, without doubt. And she's a woman, she's a minority, she's young, uh, and she's going to do very well in those early tests, very early. Bernie is holding on to his peeps like I can't believe. They're just hanging on like crust. 
And my, my, my kids, my kids are, they're just Bernieites or whatever you call them. They got their burn. They just, Michael and his, his wife, partially means no more student debt. <laughs> That's a good one. It means the health care is taken care of so you don't have to get a regular job. There's all kinds of things going. He's, a, he's an old lefty, but he's figured how to, you know, gussy up the appeal. He knows how to sell. So he's up there. And Larry David will be back on Saturday Night Live pretty soon. <laughs> Larry told me once the greatest thing in his life, the greatest, not writing Seinfeld, the greatest thing in his life was, was, was being Saturday Night Live and playing, the, playing uh, Bernie. He's, there, he's, he's changed. He's got the accent right. He's got everything. Um, anyway, I think, I think Biden's going to run. Uh, God help him, though. God help him. Because it's gonna, I like him. Everybody likes him. A lot of minorities like him. A lot of minorities trust him. I've seen the numbers. He's hopeful of getting big minority support in places like South Carolina. I tell you, he will be a positive force, but he's never hurt anybody with his, with his goofy things he said. And he said a lot of goofy things, but he's never hurt anybody with it. But he'll get hurt himself. And he's going to go on his apology tours. God help him. I, I think he should be like the lady in uh, the Music Man. Excuse me for living. <laughs> That's what I, I think he should say to every shot about Anita Hill and about, about busing and everything that comes back. He should just say, excuse me for living. <laughs> Because that's all you can do after a while. You can't just do apologize. You'll have nothing left. They'll rip them to pieces. So can he do that? And will people forget? Well, okay, he was a little more conservative on busing, but who wasn't upset about a busing? And Anita Hill, okay, he didn't handle it right. Uh, times have changed, fortunately, for the better. And he's got to say, I just keep learning. That would be my line. I used to do this for a business. <laughs> I used to work for politicians. I'd just say, I'm always learning. <laughs> No matter what they say, just say, I'm always learning. <laughs> and you might be able to get through this stuff. Anyway, uh, we'll see. Uh, who's the other guy? Beto. Those four, I think, are all doing well. I think the others are going to have a, make a race for it. I really like, I really like Corey this week. I had a great time. Corey is a very, very open guy. And I don't know how he, I think he's in a bracket with Kamala. I think Elizabeth's in a bracket with Bernie. You know, the brackets work and the and that ma 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 madness, because you really sort of think, whoa, they're both young, both minority, I don't know, both hip, you know, I like them, but I got to choose, and early on. So I think ev I, everybody likes them. We, we, well, keep voting, because I think we're going to get them, we're going to get them on the show next week. We're trying to do a, a town meeting. Everybody likes them. I haven't seen his clips yet. I'll wait before I do for my show prep. Uh, but everybody likes, but 30-some-year-old mayor of South Bend, come on, I mean, I mean well, excuse me, we'll see. I'll just say, I'll be like uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, we'll see, because uh, I don't have any idea whether he can win or not, but I'll wait. I'm not going to assume he's the next president yet. Buttigieg, we can't even get the name, it's Buttigieg. Everybody likes him, though. Everybody likes him, and you, have, you should vote for him. Uh, you should vote for now. I mean, move to California. You can vote in a month or two, huh? I'm making a vote. I just got a T-shirt for <laughs> Commitment. Okay, thank you. I want to start about the book, and then we'll, I'll answer any question. If you want to interrupt me, that's what I do. <laughs> um, but if you want to interrupt me, you paid your five bucks. You killed yourself. You reached way down into that pocket. Anyway, do what you want. I will not be upset. It seems to me, having been a movie buff, like most of us are our age, most of you are in my demo, uh, we love movies. I love celluloid. I love a real movie movie. You know, Cary Grant, the real movie stuff. But Marlon Brando, I want a real movie. And the only thing about movies, including TV good shows like MASH, really good shows, they're really always about the present. They're always, they can be antebellum South. It can be anything. It can be any year. It's always about, that was supposed to be about the... Um, Korean War, MASH, it was about Vietnam, who are we kidding? And, and movies are made for the audience in front of them. You don't make the movies for somebody 200 years ago, you make them for the people who are going to go to the movies. And I still think going to the movies, I'm with Spielberg on this, go to movies. And we, we use Netflix and all that stuff, but there's nothing like going to a movie. And uh, so I think they're always about today. And second thing, um, I think that biography, even biography, uh, is about relevance to people. Jack Kennedy said the reason people read biography and even read history is to answer one question. What was he like? How do you connect with this person? I mean, if you don't, what are you reading it for? Is it for the person reading it is reading it. And you're reading it with relish because you want, hey, that's sort of what I would do. Or the poor guy, what happened to him? And, and you, you connect. 
And so uh, put those things together. The books are about today, and they're about your relationship to that person. So when I started writing this book about Bobby Kennedy, I'd written Nixon and Ken Kennedy and Nixon, which I got an amazing insight because of connections, uh, especially Julia Nixon. Uh, the, but Ethel helped me a lot with, with Bobby. Uh, a lot of connections with uh, Ted, uh, Kenny, Don Kenny O'Donnell's daughter, Helen, transcribed all her father's interviews with uh, Sandy Van Oker of NBC. Huge, piles and piles of tapes. So I've got these insights, but this thing with Bobby, um, I knew Paul Corbin, uh, one of Bobby's, he was a hatchet man for Bobby. He was a tough, tough customer. He went to the funeral at uh, Hickory Hill, in fact. Uh, it, Paul Corbin was the kind of Dick Tuck, dirty trickster, but he was so good at it. He knew where to, s to spread the anti-Catholic literature in the Wisconsin primary in 1960. Now, where would you want to spread the anti-Catholic literature to have the most impact? Catholic neighborhoods. Like, my mom would, would go through crazy when the Seventh Day Adventist showed up. You can't have a Catholic president. She was sort of lean Republican. Well, she voted for Kennedy, but she's also Mary Shields. She was gonna vote for Kennedy anyway. But you, if you want to stir up trouble, go to the people that are gonna be most offended by it. Corbin knew all that trick in instinctively. Anyway, he was a character. He told me a lot about Bobby. He loved Bobby. He cried when you brought up his name. And that was when we were doing a speech here in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights actually, that night at the Montauk Club. Is that still around? Yeah. That's a piece of work. That's great. Uh, I don't think I'll be back. Anyway, I want to talk about June of uh, 1968 when we lost Bobby. Uh, and everybody here, close to, in my, if you're my age, you remember just like you remember Dallas. It's one of those things that uh, everybody says 9-11. Yeah, 9-11 was big. But the personal things, just they rock you and change you. I was up there in uh, Montreal, a friend of mine from, I was at UNC on a PhD economics program at the time at the University of North Carolina, and one of the guys that lived in my off-campus housing uh, said, why don't you go up to Montreal, I'm going for the weekend, I'm looking for a job up there. He's one of these guys who want to get out of the war. I said, what the heck, I've never been out of the country on my own, let's go went up for the weekend. And at three o'clock in the morning, and we spent the weekend trying to find the Kennedy, the Bobby Kennedy, uh, Jim McCarthy debate on TV up in Canada. We go into a bar, can you turn on the debate? You big shot Americans, you come in here, you tell us what to watch. He's watching Lawrence Welk. I go, I'm sorry to interrupt your American night here. Anyway, got up at three o'clock in the morning, turned on the radio, still listen to the radio in those days, and uh, I thought I was listening to a reprise. I was listening to a tape from Dallas. And I could not believe it. I uh, couldn't believe it. I woke the other guy up and said, you do not believe what's going on right now. And I... Uh, I got in a car, a cab to the airport the next day to come back to uh, North Carolina, and um, the French Canadian cab driver was a, was a small person. I mean, a real small person. He said, the giant has stubbed its toe. He had a little nationalistic attitude about it, but everybody had an attitude. And that day, that Monday, I think it was, the, we all watched the uh, funeral. And it wasn't like a terrible beauty. It wasn't Yatesian like Jack's funeral with the horses and De Gaulle and everybody there. It was uh, a gray day, as you remember, a little drizzly, very gray emotionally. But what I remembered about that day and what inspired this book was the people along the train tracks, because that was the great Bobby Kennedy legacy. It wasn't a great speech, although there was one great speech in Indianapolis. It was really who he was, his soul. And uh, you would see black people, 20,000 spontaneously singing uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Nobody does that. They did at 30th Street Station in Philly. They start singing, and all the white people are just crying, watching it. It's a very emotional time. And I tell you what grabbed me with the pictures of my book of the white people, the working class white people, who are now Trumpers, are all along the tracks. They are the Trumpers today. I saw on Fifth Avenue today. They're regular income people who have lost faith in the Democratic Party, but then were patriotically connected to it. It was patriotic unity, white and black. And Bobby would do this. He would drive around the streets of uh, Gary, Indiana with Richard Hatcher, the first African-American mayor, on one side of him in a convertible, and Tony Zale, the middleweight champion, who was, had some long Eastern European name, a real name. And he, uh, would, remember, he fought Rocky Graziano three times, beat him twice. But in the movie with Paul Newman, he only beat him once. Just a <laughs> small point. But that was Tony Zale. He wanted to have a white guy and a black guy next to him to show we're all together. The president doesn't do that. He doesn't make an effort. And it always takes an effort in this country on race. It takes an effort. It's not easy. 
So that funeral sort of inspired me to write this book. Um, and people ask me what was different. You know, would Bobby have won the convention in 60? I don't know. I know that I've learned one word in politics these days, dynamics. And it's a word that really is how we live our lives. Just like Monday leads to Tuesday, you don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday until you know what happens on Monday. Things lead to another. After winning the California primary, that night he was killed. Bobby could have gone two weeks later to a very tough, and anybody remembers the politics in this city, in New York, the whole area, all the boroughs, was very pro G. McCarthy, very in the Democratic Party. He was the second coming of Adlai Stevenson. He was the hero to all intellectuals. He was like, like Rachel is today, my colleague. No, the professor you want to have. You wish you could go to that class. And but McCarthy was like that, Stevenson was like that. Uh, Bobby would have had to win that race two weeks later. So I'd say, I always say to people, I don't know if he won in New York or not. New York was tough. It was, a Stevenson, it was Stevenson country, just like California was, going into the 60 race against Jack. Stevenson had a very loyal following. And uh, a little bit like, no, it's still, I'm not going to compare him to Bernie because it's different. It's a different generation. Older people who've seen a lot like Stevenson. In fact, Ike once said, if I'd known the Democrats were going to run somebody that good, I wouldn't have ran. Whether he said it or not, I, I like the sound of it. <laughs> So I don't know, but I think one thing I know for sure, well, I was, like all of us, I watched the 68 convention. I watched every minute of it. Cronkite would put us to bed at night. So get up in the morning, get some sleep. I mean, it was, there's nothing like it today. And Cronkite and Severide were unbelievable together. And uh, I remember uh, the way that convention was a disaster. Outside, the cops were having their massacre of the kids. The kids were awful, too, some of them, really awful. Some of them, they were not students. <laughs> Look at some of them on Grant Park. But I think that uh, if Bobby had come into that convention alive, history would have been different. Win or lose, it would have been a different country because the country needed hope in the Vietnam War. They needed somebody to be a leader against it. And once we lost that, by August of 68, there was nobody opposed to the, the, the Vietnam War except the, the kids in the crowd out in, the, out in Grand Park. That wasn't enough. We needed a leader. I think it would have been hope. Would have been, the difference in the mood... I was at the 67 March on the Pentagon. I bet there's some people here that were there. 67, Norman Mayo were all there and all those guys. And I remember the spirit of that. It was nuns, it was young couples with kids pushing baby carriages. It was so optimistic, the anti-war movement. In the two or three years that came later, it became a very pessimistic movement, a very angry, na nasty movement even. People rooting for the other side and that kind of thing, uh, Jane Fonda, all that stuff. It just changed in its tone and its hope. The anti war movement was very hopeful with Bobby and Gene McCarthy, very hopeful. And that died. When I got back to the United States after spending uh, two years in Africa in the Peace Corps, by the way, I chose to join the Peace Corps the weekend he was killed. I don't know if they're connected or not. I, just, I was up in Montreal, I had a list of things. The one positive thing I can do is go uh, work in economic development in the third world in Africa. So um, I remember how different it was. In fact, I arrived at JFK coming back from Africa in the Peace Corps for the first time home. I didn't I had maybe, I don't know if I ever phoned home. It was such a complicated thing to phone in those days over there. And I may have gotten a couple of letters. Dad gave me 10 bucks before I left, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> One of those don't spend it all at once things. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. And I, uh, but there, the kids at the, uh, the baggage handlers at JFK had long hair. I said, what the hell's going on here? When I left, the, the Ivy League kids had long hair. What's going on? So time had changed, become more broke. It wasn't that uh, happy a time in the 70s. It was Nixon and it was all that. I think Bobby took away a lot of hope for us. And, and I think that's the big thing that changed is the Bobby's leaving. I want to talk about him maybe for a few minutes because I want you to buy the book. <laughs> he had a problem with his father. His father was a prick, okay? He was a bad guy. He's an anti-Semite to start with, keep working. There's a lot more bad about him. Uh, he didn't care about anything in the country. He had no patriot patriotism, whatever. Uh, he didn't want to go to fight with the Nazis because he didn't see, and he didn't want to support the Cold War because he thought, uh, excuse me, he thought the Cold War wouldn't be, would, was not good for business. He wanted Britain to fall, Western Europe to fall, because that would create more business opportunities for Americans. That's, that's a, that was his view of the post-war era. His, his attitude toward Hitler was, so what? He wasn't interested in fighting him. He saw no problem with him. In fact, you start, read stuff in the book when he's dealing with von Dirks and the German ambassador just telling him, I know you have a problem with the Jewish people, just keep it cool, keep it, keep it out of the press. That was his advice, better PR. It's unbelievable. Bobby didn't like that, Bobby was a good guy. In fact, uh, from the time he was a kid, he was his own guy. 
there was a priest up in Boston, up in Cambridge, who had his own little operation up there, who was basically, when Bobby was at Harvard, uh, something called uh, No Salvation Outside the Church. He said, everybody goes to hell who's not a Catholic. And Bobby goes crazy about that. He writes a letter to the Cardinal complaining about his mother's scared to death. He's going to get excommunicated. <laughs> Thank God Father Feeney was excommunicated. <laughs> that was nice. Uh, he was doing the, he always cared about poor people. Even though he was a rich kid at Milton Academy, his best friend Dave Hackett, he'd always talk about the poor people outside the train windows. What could we do for them? In fact, Len Billings, who's a close family friend, especially of Jack's and later of Bobby, said to the old man, he's so generous. And the old man said, I don't know where he got that from. <laughs> it was a strange environment. The other person important to him was Jack, of course. There couldn't be two more different human beings than Jack. I once said to uh, Ethel, so uh, Jack was charm and Bobby was soul. And she loved it. It's so true. Jack was a charmer. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. Women, men, unbelievable. They fall before him. Just Bobby was a somewhat difficult guy to deal with in the beginning. He was awkward. He would drop things, as he said. He would trip on things. He, was, he, would all, he ran, once ran into a wall, basically, a, a glass door, trying to get the dinner on time to appease the old man. And Jack was Mr. Mr. Confidence, social confidence, walking into a, a party, knows he's on top, uh, had things under control. Bobby never did. Bobby was a human being and a vulnerable human being who had to learn everything he did because he usually got it wrong the first time, and he was imperfect. And he put, you know what changed him? And I'm no jock, but I think what changed him was college and football. I think when he, when he worked in Jack's first campaign, he was, Jack called him Black Robert. He was just a Debbie Downer. He didn't like him around. He said, get him out of here. I'll ruin the campaign. He's so downer. But when he came back and ran the campaign in 52, he was a superstar. He got him elected to the Senate against Henry Cabot Lodge. Bobby did that. And Bobby got him elected president in 1960. Bobby did that. And Bobby was always learning when Martin Luther King was uh, arrested and Mrs. King, Coretta, called up uh, and got through the campaign through good people like Harris Wofford and, uh, and Louis Martin, people I know, both going now. Uh, they got to Jack and he called up Mrs. King. And Bobby went through the roof when he first heard about it and then within a few hours was on the phone with the judge and got him out. Bobby was always like a second effort guy. First his rage, at the name of the book, and then the spirit, he would come back. It was always... It was like that in the campaign. It was like that uh, when he was attorney general. His instincts weren't good, but he would come back and fix it. Civil rights, he didn't care about civil rights before when he was attorney general, when he first became attorney general. And then John Siegenthaler, his guy, who was keeping an eye on the uh, Freedom Riders in 1960, had his head bashed in with a lead pipe and left on the ground. And John Lewis said, that's what, Bobby, that's what got Bobby turned on to the civil rights movement, somebody close to him. You only really believe what you discover yourself. We know that in life when it gets close to you. Uh, it was like that with Birmingham, with the kids out there, when all the kids went out in the streets and the fire hoses, and Bull Connor was mowing them down with the fire hoses, and Bobby secretly went back to the great Harry Belafonte and got the, he raised the money from unions and had Harry Belafonte paid off the government down there, all secretly. He was doing all this good stuff on his own, and also getting his brother away from Sinatra, which was not easy, and breaking off that whole command. Talk about a complicated relationship. You're prosecuting Sam Giancana, the godfather. Your Giancana helped your brother get elected president. Uh, what else is complicating it? Oh, yeah, your brother's having an affair with Giancana's girlfriend. <laughs> oh, one other thing. The CIA is using Giancana to get Castro, to kill him. All this is going on, and Bobby's learning about all this, and he has to, keep it, he has to kill the, all that stuff. He has to get him away from Sinatra, went crazy, because Sinatra was connected to Giancana. He's the guy that hooked him up with uh, Judy Campbell. Bob, Jackie Kennedy, I'm sorry, Jack Kennedy got away with a lot. And Bobby's job was to make sure he did and make sure that the trouble stopped. It was a difficult job, but everybody should have a brother like Bobby. <laughs> There's, that's what John, when Bobby ran for president, he said, my problem is I didn't have a Bobby. <laughs> but what a brother. Uh, and even after all the stuff he'd done for the black community secretly and all the fighting for civil rights in Birmingham and re, uh, integrating the University of Mississippi and all that horrible stuff, he led that fight. They hated him down south. He thought the black community would like him. So he meets in an apartment in Central Park South with James Baldwin and a bunch of other intellectuals, Lorraine Hansberry and people, a lot of smart people, highly educated academics, really, many of them. And they gave him hell. They gave him hell. And he was stewing afterwards. Why do they treat me like this? 
And yet two weeks later, I have the tape of it. He's sitting with Jack Kennedy in the Oval Office, and he's the one who says you gotta go on television for civil rights. And he got him to do it that next night when Jack gave the, the, the speech of the century and blew Dr. King away. And Dr. King said, he didn't just hit, he did a home run. He hit him out of the park. He was the first white guy ever to say I'm for civil rights at the presidential level. It had never been done before. And he just said, we're for it. It's as old as the scriptures, as American as the Constitution. We're going to do it. No more waiting. And Bobby in that room got him to do it. It's astounding to watch him do it. Jack, I got some speech ready. We got some peach pie. We could do this. You got to do this. And Jack's like, oh, God, what am I doing here? But he did it. And you should look that up on YouTube, that speech. Because the notes are not all there yet. Jack's sort of putting it together as they put it together at night. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we all lived through, uh, we lived through it in a way that was scary. Because we thought, you know, we'd hidden under desks from the times we were in first grade. Those little balsa wood desks you hid under. Because <laughs> nuclear war was coming. And, then, and all they had was some air. And the nuns would say 15 minutes to the end of the world. And uh, say your prayers. And there'll be a flash of light. And then it's over and then the general judgment. It was all religion, safety, and exercise worked in together. <laughs> and, uh, but, you, but you remember those 15 minutes under the desk, I can tell you that. And uh, so we, when, when that hit in 1962, in October, it was real. And, this, and thank God we had Kennedy and Bobby there, because Bobby's first thing to think was, bomb the, bombs away. And then he starts thinking. This is always the Bobby method. The second thing was to think. First was rage, then thinking. Wait a minute, how many Cubans are we going to kill? We're just people. We're just going to kill it. Because they weren't just knocked the, 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 the launchers out. They, had a blow, they knew they had to go in and take over the country. Because you had to just you know, bomb a country with impunity. You had to take it over. And they're worried about all the Russians there. They're going to kill them. What that going to lead to? And then Khrushchev, who wasn't really evil, but he was tough. Khrushchev's thinking over there, you move on Cuba, we move on Berlin. They move on Berlin, that's World War II, because we didn't have enough troops. We are outnumbered like 12 to 1. They had 350,000 Warsaw Pact troops right around Western, uh, West uh, Berlin, and we had about a couple, you know, 20 or 30,000. We couldn't possibly hold them off. We'd go to, uh, we'd go to uh, local, uh, we used to small uh, me megatonnage weapons to, to save the city, because no president can get reelected after he loses Berlin. Then we know all this. So it was a series of chain reactions we knew would happen if we invented, but it took a brain. That's what I wanted to have in our president. A consequential brain. <laughs> Somebody knows if you do this, then that will happen. You do this, that will happen. You know, I don't know if you always, I think the Golan thing, for example, is probably going to get away. That's a pretty smart move. I hate to say this, but it's a pretty smart because it doesn't really offend anybody. And Syria's in no position to say you can't do it. And the liberal community, the Jewish community in this country is not that upset about it. Or the other thing, moving the capital was, to me was just troublemaking. But he's, occasionally Trump does things he doesn't get any consequence to. And, and here the Kennedy brothers saying, no, if we do this, then he'll do this, and then what are we going to do? In this chess match with nuclear weapons, but fortunately they decided, the two brothers, especially Bobby, no, we're not going to go in there. We're going to do it with the, with the uh, sanctions. We're going to do it at the quarantine, and we're going to hope it works. And thank God, and he went over to talk to uh, Debrinin. The, uh, Debrinin came to him at the Justice Department, and they worked it out. And Debrinin was blown away. He said, this guy is a tough guy, but he's like a father. He's worried about his kids. And Khrushchev magically said, we're calling it off. And he was finished, of course, for doing that. Because the good guys, you know, like Anwar Sadat and, and uh, a certain prime minister of Israel, who you all love, Yitzhak Rabin, the good guys get killed. Usually that's what happens. I think, uh, and that's why it's a terrible situation over there. Maybe here too someday. But I think the fact that they were able to work that thing, and Khrushchev, God, say, God love him, he said, I'm, going to take the, I'm taking the hit. And I'm no communist, but I was impressed with him. Because in the end, he said, it's not worth it. Blow up the world. And so we got through it, and I think Bobby and Jack are key to that. And, um, but it's always the second effort. I think when you, when you raise kids, tell them, think. <laughs> you got an instinct, but think a little. What's coming next? And I think that's a... And that secret deal, they said, we'll take the missiles out of, Cuba, out of Turkey if you'll take them out of uh, Cuba. Thank God that never leaked. That, that would not have sold well the country at the time in the Cold War. So Bobby gets to be senator from New York. And he, and he goes through this same kind of process, amazing as your senator, amazing. He, he goes out to see the California farm workers, and he says, what am I doing this trip for? 
And then he meets Cesar Chavez, and he, they become the closest people in the world. And he, he, it becomes his cause. We called them Chicanas back then. Nobody was looking out for them. I don't know if they're documented or not, but they were way underpaid. They weren't allowed to meet. They weren't allowed to organize. And they're getting screwed. And Bobby went out and became their great champion with, uh, with Chavez. You get down to South Africa, right where I was in the Peace Corps, Cape Town gave the best speech ever given down there. And he didn't go in there with any moral superiority. He just said, you know, let's talk about a country that was, in, that was uh, colonized by the Dutch. And then the Dutch were beaten by the English and pushed out. And then later on had racial issues. It was us. It was New York. The same history as South Africa, pretty much the same time period. And he, he didn't do it with any superiority, just an amazing thing. It probably helped move things along historically. Uh, and I think that, uh, where am I? Back to page one again. Jesus. <laughs> what I liked about him is he, uh, he was vulnerable. He went into Indianapolis during his campaign for president. And of course, there's another case. We didn't want to run. He's afraid to run because it'll break the party apart. He went up running after uh, McCarthy did his business up in New Hampshire, which we all rooted for. 90 some percent of the vote up there against Johnson, or 40 some percent, 44 percent against Johnson. And Martin Luther King is killed. And he's about to go into Indianapolis to the black neighborhood, the Broadway neighborhood. And it's a tough neighborhood. It's not a minority neighborhood, it's a tough neighborhood, scary neighborhood, a lot of crime. The police wouldn't go in with him. He wouldn't, they wouldn't escort him in. They said, we're not going past this line, we're not going in. And uh, he went in, got up on a flatbed truck, and I got the tape from NBC and he said to the guy next to him, uh, do they know yet? And the guy said, no, they don't know yet. You've got to tell them. The king was just killed. This is before social media. Nobody, kids can't imagine this today. Like they can't imagine talking on a telephone when you can't see. You know, they, what's this? this? What's this thing? I can't see that other person. But then there was no social media. And, uh, and Bobby said, okay, I'll tell them. And he tells this black crowd. He's the white guy there. And he talked to things, I thought awkward at the time, but it was so Bobby, he said, you know, my brother was killed by a white guy. And I thought that was a stupid thing to say. He wasn't killed because he's white or white. But he was trying to say, look, I've been through this. I've been a mourner. I've, uh, I lost my brother I loved. I'm not over it yet. I won't be. And I think it was a way of connecting with, as if to, to human beings. I don't know any Paul could do this. I never heard of a politician. McCarthy couldn't have done it. And uh, Johnson couldn't have done it. I mean, nobody could have done it. And I think that was, uh, was a uh, time uh, we had a great man when we needed one, and then we lost him. And so uh, I guess the story is every once in a while come, somebody comes along we need. And, uh, and, we, and we've been very fortunate. I, I, what your president said is what I do believe about the country. We've, been, we've beaten the odds as a country. We had FDR. Figure that one out. Where the heck did he come from? New York. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys. What a provincial crowd you are. <laughs> but you're right. He came there. He came from up to upstate. Anyway, he was there. He had to, somehow, his mother put in him the confidence, you are a great person, and you're going to be able to do this. He had the self-confidence to, uh, to lead us when there's no hope. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. And then he got it through the war. He got us in as soon as he could. But he got us through that war. And he united the country. And he gave a barn burner of speech when the Japanese attacked. And it was over. Everybody agreed. Lindbergh was gone and I was out of the picture. And Joe Kennedy was out of the picture. And, uh, and he, I still see every World War II movie I can see. It still makes me happy. Moral clarity. I love moral clarity. And everybody does. And I think that... Uh, we're going to have an interesting race this time. I, I think Trump is, can win again. It's going to be a Democrat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Uh, I hear that Joe Biden would carry this state today. My wife, Kathy, said it was, he's, he'd carry this state 65%. But as we know from the Electoral College, it doesn't do any good. New York was a million and a half for Hillary last time. California was about two and a half. It had about four. Um, it didn't happen. It didn't matter. What matters is which states to carry. So it's going to come down to Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, those big three. Maybe, you know, he almost carried Minnesota, which lost by a point and a half. It was close. Florida is tough for the Democrats. It just is. Ohio is very tough. Ohio is very tough. But uh, if Biden can run a strong campaign and stay there and doesn't, get, doesn't say goofy things too often, if Kamala comes along and find a little way to the center by the general election, going to move a little to the center, I think her prosecutorial background will end up helping her. 
in the general, or heard in the primary. This, uh, but please believe, because if you don't believe, you don't vote. And I think we all believe we can do it, to have a, a great election with a great debate. And just think about those debates. Imagine somebody going up against Trump and what it'll be like. Because this time, they will not let that pull that gorilla number he told last time with Hillary. They're going to turn around and say something to him. And shake, or he won't have the nerve to do that, what he did in that campaign. And, uh, and they've got to be ready for the nicknames and the human slaughter that comes from him. And it's going to be one heck of a race. I'm for it. I, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm tired of talking about him. I am sick. <laughs> But New York, uh, to answer the provincial comment made a minute ago. Was that you, Jim, New York? No, no. that was me. <laughs> well, did respond to your greatness. New York has been amazing. I mean, you had a police commissioner here I, we'll never forget. Remember him? Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> that, he was one hell of a police commissioner. He's on Mount Rushmore. And if you ever want to be re-inspired, go out to South Dakota, like I did, like I was an immigrant. I'm like some guy just got off the boat at Ellis Island. And I'm sitting out there an entire day looking at those guys, thinking, what are they thinking? What's that expression? <laughs> so I do think we're going to make it. I'm with Faulkner. The past is all with us, but we're going to prevail. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's do it. Yes. Where do you think the two parties are actually headed, if you want to say ideologically, or for what they stand for? Because right now, the Democrats are, are heading as a party that wants to build a series of social policies yeah. that we're bankrupt. I know that all the numbers. Tr Trump is depleting all cash from the reservoirs. The, whatever Democrat does Well, we were already going in, broke before he started. And, uh, I, I think we have to do, um, I disagree with the people who call themselves socialists. I mean, that's Bernie, you know, I guess Ocasio. Because I, I, I think we have a unique character in this country. It's a little different than Europe. Uh, and everybody comes from, a lot of people come from Europe. But I'm not sure we can, that transfers very well. I think the way Roosevelt sold Social Security to the middle class was that he didn't have a, he didn't have a means test. Now... They, later on, under other presidents, we found, under Clinton, we found a way to means test by taxing a certain percentage of our benefits. There are ways to do it. But I think it's really important to Americans, us, to believe that we paid into it. And it's ours. It's not welfare. And it's not out of the general fund. It's dedicated funding from, uh, from uh, payroll taxes. And so from the time everybody here my age, I guess some people are old as me, you start paying in in your teens under law. You go to jail if you don't do it. So from the time you're 15 and working in a drugstore to the time you're 65, you're paying in every year and getting nothing in the Medicare. You're getting nothing under Social Security, but you're paying in every year. And then if you're a guy, you live about 15 more years. Women do better off under this system. <clears throat> about 15 more years. So for 50 years in, you get 15 coming out. That's the deal. But you always know every penny of that was yours. You have a right to it. It's yours. You get into socialism and what society owes to individuals, and you get into, then I get worried about, well, what are individuals owe to society? <coughs> I'm a little wary of it. And I don't think you can sell Medicare for all just like that. So people paid in 50 years, well, what are you? What am I, just sitting here? <coughs> I think you got to understand the American character. It's not Bernie. Bernie doesn't get it. I think, uh, I think we have to figure out Obamacare and fix it. I don't know why we don't just fix it. That would probably sell because of pre-existing condition, and, and we've had kids are beyond 26 now, but I think it was a very popular thing because everybody knows the failure to launch and all that stuff. It's, it's in our society today. <clears throat> kids don't go off and start making money at 22. <clears throat> they just don't. And uh, everyone knows that story. Uh, <laughs> everybody knows that story. Uh, so uh, I think the idea of helping the kids a little, give them a little trainer wheels for five years or so, very popular idea. And I think uh, pre-existing is very popular because that's what insurance is. You insure against something you can't control. Now, I'm diabetic. I mean, I didn't pick it. I, actually, that was my fault, but <laughs> <laughs> too many candy bars. But uh, uh, I do think it's fine. I think we got to move slowly. I think Medicare came at the right time. I think, uh, I think uh, 
fix Obamacare. But I'm a moderate Democrat. I always say in the British Labor Party, I'd be on the right of the British Labor Party. I'm somewhere in the right part of the left-wing party. That's where I've always felt very comfortable. Right wing of the left-wing party. <laughs> that's, my, that's my blankie. That's, that's, that's where I am politically. Uh, but I do always, my friends have always been to my left. Isn't that weird? All my friends have been to all my life have been to my left. Figure that one out. It's a social proclivity, but it's true, yeah. When Jack and, and their father was in London, was Bobby in London with them, or was Yeah, there's a college? picture in the book of him. He was, uh, he was uh, a kid. Yeah, he was a kid, yeah. Um, Trump has been uh, criticized for being di uh, like a dictator. You've done this, too. Uh, because of his nepotism and apparently yeah, his family. Yeah, I agree. I don't think you well, should do I that. would like you to contrast that with what JFK did yeah. in appointing Bobby and I think Sergeant Shriver, who, well, I don't know, you yeah. know, his own. Well, they were better people. Oh. That's not, that's not. <laughs> that. Well, first of all, first of all, Shriver's one of my heroes because he built the Peace Corps into what it was. He had a couple of rules. All, it's a volunteer-led organization. It's not a big shot thing in Washington. The real heroes of the Peace Corps are the people out there, nowhere right now, nowhere, with the, living with the local people. And the other thing is, he said, five years and you're out. It's not gonna be some lifetime thing to do. Get out of here after five years, I love that. Uh, Bobby had run his campaign in 52. He had, had headed up the Rackets Committee uh, from 57 to 59. He had gone after all the bad guys, Jimmy Hoff and all of them. He had been fighting horrible, horrible, frightening characters in those four years there. Bobby was a grown-up. I don't care what age he was. He got his brother elected to the House. He got a Senate. He got elected to the President. He did it all. He was the, they named, you know what the name of the Justice Department building is? The Robert F. Kennedy Building, because he's one of the great Attorney Generals ever. So he happened to be his brother. You know this story. Well, he comes out of his house in Georgetown, and the plan was, Bobby, comb your hair. First thing he said, Bobby, comb your hair. And the other was, I'm just going to go out and say Bobby and then run into the house. But it's Bobby. That was what he was going to do. Hey, look, it worked. I'm generally against this Romanoff style of government we have today. You know, they're all over the place. Let's see. Let's get it straight. As of this week, Junior is in charge of getting uh, Brexit through. And, 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 and telling Theresa May, the prime minister, that she ought to get on her horse and get it done and not negotiate it. He says, don't negotiate, just end it. That's Junior doing that. Then, of course, this genius, uh, Jared, he's redesigning the Western world and the Middle East together. He is redesigning the whole Middle East. Like he thinks he's Winston Churchill. Like he's saying, we're going to have the Saudis give some land to the Jordanians. The Jordanians are going to give somebody... We're going, to, we're going to give away the goal line, but of course, oh, I'm sorry, we moved the embassy. It's not going to happen. The Arabs are not going to get together with us. I think he's crazy. Maybe I'll be wrong. But I don't think the Arabs are ever going to agree to recognize uh, total Israeli right to Jerusalem. I mean, I've always thought, I don't know, first of all, there's no Arab leadership right now in Palestine, the Palestinian territories. I don't know whose fault that is, Bibi or their fault, but it's a combination. Bibi certainly doesn't believe in the two-state. Clearly does. And I don't know if the two-state would work right now. I'm not an expert. I keep sometimes, sometimes I'm just pro-tough guy on, from the Israeli point of view. And other times I go, come on, you've got the power, you can afford to fix this thing. But uh, there's no simple solution waiting for us. And they're, they're going, it's just, I think, crazy, though. I think, uh, I don't know why Jared's doing this. We have a State Department. Why aren't they doing it? Um, it's weird. And they do it on, I went to a meeting at the White House two months ago. Roosevelt Room. All the Roosevelt pictures on the wall. Guess who ran the meeting? We had about 20 people there. Jared. It is, it is the Romanovs. Yes. Thank you. To understand the person in the context of our times. And when you pull together Bobby Kennedy saying that he opposed graduate deferments for, during the Vietnam War, and we talk about failure to launch in the presidency. He was against college deferments. Yes. Uh, and then when we look at the current situation where there's a failure to launch, being recalled, there's this constant debate over how to achieve the collective good. Do you think Bobby Kennedy would have supported some form of national service draft? Yeah, I think he wanted, certainly the Kennedy brothers believed in national service because they all did it. I mean, Jack almost was killed. He was lost for about 10 days. His brother was killed. Uh, Bobby, uh, ja uh, uh, Bobby gave up Bratzi, where he could have stayed through the war, but he, he got into the Navy as an enlisted guy. 
they were real patriotic guys, um, classic. And I, maybe it's a different time. My grandma, who was an immigrant from Northern Ireland, she had the, her three sons on the wall in their, in their uniforms. I mean, that was a different time. You know, one was the Air Force in Australia, one was liberating the camps in the tank, Uncle George, and my dad in Navy Intelligence. And they, it was a time when we all went. Uh, but the trouble is, I don't want anybody in the Peace Corps with me in some place in the middle of nowhere who didn't want to be there. I think you got to be careful about mandatory anything, because spirit is everything. Churchill, man is spirit. I don't think you want people next to you. Well, where, the, the funny thing is, though, General, uh, who's this guy who's on all the time? One of the generals on our show all the time told me they had 50,000 troops under him in Vietnam, all draftees. McCaffrey, all draftees. Which, that's why they call them dog face. Dog faces. They don't want to be there at all. Who would want to be there? But uh, I don't know about national service. I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing to make part of American life like getting married. One of those things. Like you do this. as something a lot of people do. But you don't make everybody do it. You know? You can't make people get married, can you? Ha! <laughs> 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 yes, sir. We're gonna finish up. I don't. Want, I got A lot of people have commented that Trump's biggest concern shouldn't be Mueller, but it should be the Southern District. And I was wondering if you'd comment on. Who that. knows? <laughs> uh, after last night, I don't know anything. I, I, uh, everybody says that all the liberals on the fo on the shows today. I was watching my network. They're all the liberals are still praying that something will happen. I understand that. There's a lot of emotion here. And he has not been a good president. And I understand the emotion for him getting caught. But in the end, I think it's the voters. And uh, I don't know, Agnew cut a deal, remember? Maybe that'd be a good deal. What do you think? <laughs> you go, <laughs> we leave you alone. <laughs> I don't know. They did it with Agnew. They had him, they had dead to rights. And they said, if you leave, you won't be prosecuted. I have no idea what, what goes on in New York and the uh, SDNY. And, uh, uh, I think he won't be impeached for that. I think the Repub Republicans are with him 88% right now. People like Lindsey Graham are with him. They're with him like you can't, I've never seen anything like this. Lindsey, I've always liked Lindsey. I said the other night at the thing we went to, I said, Lindsey, I don't know what it is, but no matter what you do, I still like you. <laughs> and he says, he says, no matter what I do, I still like me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get this, this debasement of the Republican Party. I mean, it, I grew up when there was a Republican Party which was symbolized by the New York Herald Tribune that great old newspaper. And it was a, a moderate Republican point of view. It was Rockefeller, Javits, the rest of them. Uh, in fact, they had an attorney general up here for years who was one of those guys, Louis Lefkowitz. And, and it, it, in my state, it was Hugh Scott, and it was Bill Scranton, and uh, Tom Ridge later on, it was Christine Whitman. I mean, every state in the Northeast had a, a Republican or two senators, and they were all moderate Republicans. They were all for civil rights. All of them were. The Republican Party was the Civil Rights Party in 64. But the Democrats were the Seggies. They were awful, most of them. But the Republican Party was the good party. Nixon, back in the 50s, before he went to the Southern strategy, was, uh, was a member of the NAACP. And his buddy was, uh, you, know, he had a, you know, Whitney Young. And he knew King pretty well. And that all died. That died because they saw their opening in the South. It was an opportunity when the South opposed civil rights, and Johnson said, we've just lost the South, the Republicans grabbed up the draft, uh, the free drafters, the free agents, basically. And that's what happened to the Republican Party. Yeah, I think we're gonna end, go ahead. Okay, so back to your wonderful book. You mentioned something about Belafonte buying a state. No, you Belafonte was, uh, was the guy who handled the money. See, remember all the kids were arrested in Birmingham. Right. Bull kind of they arrested a thousand of them, I think, and they were, Finally, King would, Dr. King would say, okay, I'll let you bail me out. He didn't want to be bailed out. He, there was a big dispute in the book about whether he wanted to be, he goes, he wanted to be a symbol. He wanted to stand up against these guys. And then they started to work with the business community of Birmingham. The Birmingham business community, white guys, basically said, this is killing our town. We've got to make some changes. So they agreed they're going to stop the segregation, all the Jim Crow stuff about this. They had to go to the back door to get a Coke and all that stuff. They were going to get rid of it. They knew they'd lost the fight. But it was a question of getting enough money to get the kids out of jail. And Bobby secretly went to, uh, who was it? Uh, 
May, it might have been, uh, who was the Irish guy who was head of the New York uh, transit workers? Uh, Quell. 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 It was Michael Quell, and he also went to the top guy at the AFL-CIO at the time, me and, I all, and he got the money. But he had to do it secretly, so he gave, they, they gave the money out of their union uh, treasuries to, um, to, to uh, Harry Belafonte. And Barry Fonte, he, uh, who's an amazing guy, uh, he, uh, he handled the whole thing secretly. Oh, yeah. I was also Bar Barry's got a really good book out. It, it, it talk I got a lot of that from him, and also I know him, but uh, hell of a history that guy had. One more last because you've been up phoning. A lot of talk about getting rid of the Electoral College yeah. among the Democratic candidates. I know. And I just wanted to know what your opinion was, and also do you think that's a helpful conversation Well, right now? I, look, there's two ways to do it. One would be a uh, constitutional amendment. But the problem is that the very reason we have it is it will never pass because the smaller states will never go along to it. Just like senators. Idaho has two senators. New York has two senators. What? And California has two. I mean, that's the way it was divided up when we were a, a set of uh, states. And it's very hard in the Constitution to need three quarters of the state. So just make a list of the, that quarter who will never go along with it, ever. It's like civil rights, you know. The idea whether to get the Civil Rights Act in 64 was by constitutional amendment? No, we had a liberal court so they could do it by statute, right, using uh, interstate commerce clause. The other way to do it is, is this compact, which my son's involved with, our son, which basically has states commit to throwing their electoral votes to the candidate gets the most popular vote in the country. Now, that is just sticking your chin out for a court fight. Because if Pennsylvania votes for Trump and the country votes for Hillary or someone else, you know there'll be a, a court fight. The, some, and somebody in Pennsylvania will have standing. They'll go this, all the way to the Supreme Court and say, our state voted for Trump. How can you give the elector votes to the Democrat? You can see that fight. So although my, my son totally believes that, I'm skeptical it'll pass the courts. But then again, it'll depend what court it is. But this, this court, no way. No, it's not gonna happen. This, this court is a conservative court. Well, I hate to say no, one last. You're all the way back. <laughs> I don't have a microphone. I wanna know what you think about Biden's ticket. Biden? Biden's ticket. Biden's ticket. Biden's ticket. Biden's ticket. I, don't, I don't think that's gonna happen. And I don't think the American people wanna be confronted with a decision made ahead of them. Personally, it's presumptuous. To say I'm going to be the nominee, so I'm going to pick the vice president. It's just not. It's not going to work. First of all, you're saying um, politically it won't work because the way you win now is you win the nomination, with the people who lost all think they're going to be on the ticket. So he's saying if you lose, it's out. It's all, we're going to win on the nose here. I win, you lose. So instead of putting George Bush on the ticket with Reagan, and it often happens, you pick the guy. Or I can get on the ticket with with uh, Obama. Uh, LBJ got on the ticket with Kennedy. I mean, that's the way it works. Second place, second place. Now you get rid of second place. I mean, she's a very attractive. I don't mean physically, but physically she's attractive. She has a wonderful smile. I really like her, and I don't even know her. I like her. She's something open about her that's really nice. Uh, but that's all I know about her. And she ran a good race in Georgia. I think Georgia's still a hard reach for the Democrats. I think you can call it purple all you want, but I think Florida's tough. What do you think? Georgia's not tougher. Uh, yeah, I think Georgia's tougher than, uh, as tough as Ohio, at least, maybe tougher. This is going to be a cl close election next time. And, uh, and I tell you, the Republicans will run the big three against you. Late-term abortion they're going to use in a lot of places. And the Democrats should, I personally believe, stop talking about it. Number two, socialism is a killer in the suburbs because what it means is taxes. Because everybody knows it's not the billionaires and the millionaires that pay. It's the guys who made 150 a week with the husband and wife both working. They're the ones that are going to pay that tax. You know, that's all the way it is. It's always those people that get hit in the taxes. Because there's a lot of them. That's where the money is. And the open borders think Democrats need a border policy. I'm sorry, they've got to come up with something. I'm going to put, uh, they don't have one. It sounds like they are for open borders. It's a killer in places like Hazleton, Pennsylvania. A killer. And they're just, it's not, it's not responsible either. Come up with a policy that can be humane, forcible, and you have to believe in it. And I don't think you should be a member of Congress if you don't believe in enforcing the law. If you're making laws, don't you believe in them? I'm sorry, that sounds conservative, but it happens to be true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris.
It was fabulous.